just time to get started today. Um, what I'm going to do today is a midterm review. No new, no new material. This is uh, hopefully just a little bit of a refresher of uh, different things we've seen over the semester. Uh, announcements for today. Um, well, hopefully it's on your calendar that the midterm is tonight at seven o'clock Pacific time. Please read the logistics post. We have a final logistics post on, on Piazza with details of how the exam will be distributed and how you'll take it what to do uh, if you have an emergency. Uh, and um, I know this is a super stressful time. It's like midterm midterm time for a lot of you. Um, and I know it's been a really stressful semester for a lot of folks. So we're gonna give you um, a short break as best we can after the midterm. So just so you know, after the midterm, we'll give you a couple of days you can recover, um, restore your mental sanity, do whatever you need to do to, to get back in shape. Um, so there'll be no homework next week. Um, discussion section next week is optional. Vitamin um, for, for next Monday's lecture will be extended. So you can have a couple of days and uh, take it easy. We will have lecture, um, but it'll be recorded as usual. So you can watch that later if you wanna take a few days and then catch up with it after you, after you get back. I know it's a really stressful time. And, and last, I wanna just say a little bit of word of encouragement. Um, you could do this tonight. You might be surprised by how much you've learned. You've come a long way. Um, all right, so let's let's go through some of the stuff you've learned. All right, so um, tables. We spent a bunch of time on tables. Um, brief reminder about some of the table operations. Uh, a lot of what we were teaching you was how to do uh, sophisticated data analysis by by combining these building blocks, these individual table operations. Um, and if you need to, if you have a table and you need to keep some of the columns, you can use dot uh, select or drop. Yeah, you got this. That's right. Right on. Uh, if you need to keep some of the rows, you can use dot where. It's a really common pattern. Um, select some of the rows um, uh, that match some criteria using the where operation. Um, if you need to add a column, use with column. If you need to find this the smallest or the biggest item or the or the earliest or the first, um, then sort. Sort them. You can sort in, um, normally it's an increasing order, but if you set the descending flag, you sort it into decreasing order if you want the biggest and then take the first, um, dot column, dot item zero, for instance. And if you want to run a function, every value in a column, use the apply. What's the difference between take and where? Where lets you select rows by some criterion. Like give me all the rows where the age is less than 15. You'd use where for that. Take lets you select rows by the row number. Give me the first and second row in the table. Dot take would do that. You'd say dot take zero uh, and make an array with zero and one in it. If you find that the information is split across two tables, you should be super, super suspicious. Do I need to do a join somewhere? Join will combine them into one table. Once you got them in one table, you can use all the operations you want on that one. If you need to um, aggregate the data. Aggregate means I have a bunch of data, a bunch of numbers maybe, or a bunch of strings or something, and summarize them with a single value. That's what aggregating is. If you need to do some kind of aggregation on a table and you want to break it down by one attribute, like uh, give me the average salary, but broken down by zip code. Okay, so for each zip code, I want to know the average salary of people in that zip code. Then um, that's a Look for a group operation. And if you want to break it down by two attributes, want to break it down both by zip code and by whether you're employed or not, then you should be thinking about either pivot or group. Often pivot produces a more useful table. It's kind of a two-dimensional table where the rows represent one attribute and the columns represent the other attribute. Also, you could use dot group where you group on multiple columns and that will find uh, all combinations of those two attributes. Uh, okay, let me check for questions. Um, what does apply return? It returns an array. It applies a function to all the items within a single column and it returns an array of the results. Um, yes, dot where. Um, the criteria you use, you can either use these criteria r dot above, r dot below, r dot equal to, and um, instead of saying r dot equal to 12, 
as a shorthand, you can use just 12. What's the difference between doing apply and using a function that finds the average? Um, if you want to find the average of all the values in a column, you're taking all the values in a column and summarizing that to a single number. Okay, so that's where we're using like np.mean applied to all the values in the column, which we might have extracted with the dot column operation. Where you would use apply is where you want not a single number, but you want one number for each row. You want a whole array. Okay, so for instance, um, maybe you have a column with a bunch of years the year um, each person was born. And you'd say, I like to convert that to a bunch of ages. You could do that by using the apply operation where you provide a custom function that converts birth year to age. In other words, that function would take 2020 minus the birth year. And that would be approximately the age of the person. And then the apply operation would give you a new array with one item, one age per row of the column per birth year. Oof, lots of questions and I'm sorry, I can't keep up with all of you. Um, maybe we should be using the Piazza thread for a lot of these questions and we'll make sure to get to all of them. All right, uh, arrays. I wanna tell you a little bit about arrays. Um, anytime you have to do the same thing to each of many things, you might be, you should suspect that maybe I should put all those things in an array and use an array operation, for instance multiply all of these values by three. I could do that in a single piece of code by if they're an array, take that array times three, and that'll give you a new array where each item is multiplied by three. If you need to append, add to the end of an array, use np.append. Remember that doesn't update the existing array, it creates a new array. So you need to reassign, uh, assign that to some variable if you want to use it again. These slides should be on the website. Uh, if you want to count the number of items in a, an array that are not zero or that are not false, use np.count non-zero. Um, as someone's posting in the chat, um, we have a, a reference Python reference sheet under the resources on our, on our course webpage. That's really helpful um, to refresh yourself on all the different um, uh, operations and, 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 and and library functions in Python that we've touched. Uh, you're allowed to refer to that during the exam. Histograms. Um, you saw a bunch on histograms. So now I wanna have you do a uh, sample questions for histograms. Um, so let's go ahead and use the participants tab to go through the first one. So here's a histogram shown, and I want you to figure out which bin corresponds to more people. All right, so this histogram shows a histogram of people's salaries in um, <laughs> millions of dollars. <laughs> and uh, and um, I want to know which bin has more people in it, the bin from 10 to 15 or the one from 15 to 25. Ah, okay, I see some say 10 to 15, some saying 15 to 25, and some saying not enough information. All right, tell me a reason why someone might answer 10 to 15. Whether or not you think it's right, just give me a, an argument you might use for why you might be thinking 10 to 15. Yeah, the bar's higher. Tell me a reason why you might be thinking 15 to 25. The bar's wider, the bar's wider. Yeah, how do we take into account both the height and the width? Well, the number of people in a bin is proportional to the area of the bar. This is the area principle for histograms. It's derived from this area principle for visualizations that cognitively our eyes, our human perception tends to see things as, as um, proportional to the amount of area they take up. So, um, to make a histogram a good visualization, it should follow the area principle, which says um, the, the number of people should be proportional to the area of the bar. 
So really to answer question A, we need to figure out which bar has more area. And the 10 to 15 bar might be a little bit higher, but it's only half as wide. So the area of the 15 to 25 bar is a lot more. The area of the 15 to 25 bar is 10 wide times four high, so area 40. The area of the 10 to 15 bar is five wide and five high, so only 25. All right, so everyone who said 15 to 25 bar, you were correct. So this is a little tricky. You'll notice that here the widths of the bars are not always equal. You may or may not run into that in practice, but we like to give you practice questions involving that because that helps really emphasize this uh, area principle. All right, let's do question B. What percentage of incomes are in the 25 to 85 bin, that, that rightmost bin? See if you can figure out, I don't need the exact number, just kind of estimate as well as you can. I see some saying 12, 14, 15, 13. All right, I, I like those answers. Good, good, you're doing great. So let's, let's talk through how we would get the answer. First, let's figure out um, um, the height of the bar and the width of the bar. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the area of the bar, all right? So the percent of people in the bin should be equal to the area of the bar. In all the histograms we do in this class, the percentage is always equal to the area. And we're gonna compute the area as the height of the bar times the width of the bar. Now the width is easy, the width is 60. No, no big deal. The height, we kind of got to stare at that a little bit and estimate how high it is. You can see that first line is at one and we're at a, only a fraction of that. I don't know what that fraction is. Maybe it's a fourth, maybe it's a fifth, maybe it's a sixth of that. Let's say, I don't know, a fourth-ish, something like that. So, so it's like maybe one fourth times 60. One fourth times 60 is about 15. So maybe about 15%. Or maybe it's a little less, maybe it's 12% or 10% or maybe a little more, 18%. We're just, we're just estimating. We're not trying to get it exact, exactly perfect. So if you said something like 15%, good answer. All right, um, let's do question C. Um, here we have one bin from 10 to 15 and another from 15 to 25. But suppose that we had merged those into a single bin from 10 to 25. How high should the bar be? And for starters, why don't you just kind of estimate it, eyeball it if you want. You could do the math if you want to figure out exactly. Good, yeah, it should be at least four and at most five. It's somewhere in between, somewhere in the middle. And in fact, it's kind of the average of these. So how did I get that? Here's one way to compute it. We could figure out what proportion of people are in the 15 to 25 range. Well, everyone in, sorry, let's figure out the proportion that are in the 10 to 25 range. So that's the proportion that are in the 10 to 15 range and the proportion that are in the 15 to 25 range. So what proportion are in the 10 to 15 range? Well, that's five times five, 25%. And what proportion are in the 15 to 25 range? That's 10 times four, that's 40%. So there's 65% who are in the range 10 to 25. Now, if you wanted to draw a single bin there, we would have 65% divided by that width of 15. So 65 divided by 15, whatever that works out to. And I think 65 divided by 15 works out to about 4.333. Okay, so the height should be 4.333. All right, so there's your answers. Good job, everyone. Everyone who answered, you're doing great. Really good. I'm gonna check for questions and then I'm gonna move on. How did I know that the 15 to 25 bin had more people if I don't know the total number of people in the sample? I can only tell the area. Well, the area helped me figure out the proportion of people who are in each bin. And I know the 15 to 25 bin has a higher proportion of people than the 10 to 15 bin. So I don't actually need to know the total number of people. If the proportion's higher, the total must be higher too. All right, 
Um, you can leave your answers unsimplified on the exam. I would be fine if instead of entering the exam 4.33, you wrote um, 65 over 15. Um, the units, it's helpful to remember the units on the y-axis are always percent per something, where the something is whatever the units on the x-axis are. Okay, let's do probability. We looked a little bit at how to compute probabilities, how to compute chances. Um, all right, first exercise. Got some marbles. We got a jar full of marbles. Uh, here are the marbles we got. We got uh, 10 marbles, four greens, three reds, two blues, one yellow. And I'm gonna draw four at random with replacement. I'm gonna like close my eyes shuffle up the jar and pick one at random. Okay, equally likely to be any of those 10 marbles. I'm gonna look at the color and then with replacement. So I put it back in the jar, I shake it back up again. I close my eyes, I pick one out. So that's another one. Could be any of the 10, could have been the same as the first, could be a different one. Until I've looked at the colors of four marbles and I wanna compute the probability that all four that I drew are green. So how would I do this? Should I use the addition rule, the multiplication rule, complement rule, something else? Yeah, I use the multiplication rule because this is the probability of the first one is green times the probability of the second one is green times the probability of the third one is green, the probability of the fourth one is green. Whether the first one was green has no effect on the chances that the second one will be green. All right. So the, probably the first one was green was four tenths and I multiply four tenths times four tenths times four tenths times four tenths. Now let's do the probability that none of them are green. Cool, we need the multiplication rule and we also need the complement. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, oh, be careful. Ooh, this one was trickier. I got you on this one. Looks like I got some of you. All right, anyone who said one minus the answer for all green, nope, that's not correct. Because you could have, you could have um, some of them were green. It might be all green, might be none of them green, or might be some of them green. So um, the second probability is not one minus the first probability. Your idea of doing a one minus is reasonable. The probability that none of them are green is the probability that the first one is not green, that the second one is not green, that the third one is not green, and the fourth one is not green. Notice I said and, so you should be suspicious of the multiplication rule. The probability that the first one is not green, well, let's count. How many ways are there to get a not green marble? There's one, two, three, four, five, six marbles that are not green. So there's a six tenth chance that the first one's not green. And then the same for the second and the third and the fourth. So the answer is six tenths times six tenths times six tenths times six tenths. Or you could have gotten it by saying, what's the probability the first one's not green? Well, the probability it is green is four tenths. So the probability the first one's not green is one minus that, one minus four tenths, which is the same as what we just got, six tenths. All right, good. So six tenths to the fourth power. One more, one more, one more. Um, what's the probability that at least one of the four marbles I draw is green. Yeah, now I use the complement rule. It's really convoluted to do this directly. It's like there's many possible ways I could get at least one green. It might've gotten one green or two greens or three greens or four greens. And that green that I got might've been the first one or the third one or so many cases, it's looking really complicated to compute this. So anytime you got something that's looking really complicated to compute, check, is it easier to compute the probability of the complement? If I don't get at least one green, the only way that can happen is if I get no greens. I already figured out how to compute the probability there's no greens. So the probability there's at least one green is one minus that. One minus six tenths to the fourth power. All right, good, 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 good. So uh, use the multiplication rule if you find yourself using the word and. 
Um, if you find yourself with multiple different ways something could come true, suspect maybe the addition rule. And anytime the computation is getting really, really ugly, but the complement is easier to compute the probability of, use the complement rule, one minus. Oh, good question in the chat. If the question asks without replacement, what would the answer be? Let's do it. Let's do the same question, but now without replacement. So I draw one marble out of the jar, and then I stick that marble in my pocket. Now there's only nine marbles in the jaw, in the jar. And then I draw another marble. And that second marble, it's going to be all nine of those are going to be equally likely. So the second marble can't be the same marble as the first. It could potentially be the same color, but it won't be the same marble. Um, there's no cheat sheet. We're trying to teach you the approach how you could work this out on your own. Um, we'd rather you know that rather than remember any formulas. Okay. So now in this new world where we're doing without replacement, what's the probability that all four marbles I draw are green? Good, 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 good. Yeah, we're a multiplication rule again. Probably the first one is green is four tenths. There's four green ones out of the 10 in the jar. All four, all possibilities are equally likely. So four tenths for the first marble. And then the second marble, well, the first one was green and I removed it from the jar. So now there's only three green left in the jar. So what's left in the jar is three green ones, nine marbles in total, not the one that I drew first. That, that first one was a stick sitting in my pocket. So for the second marble, there's a three ninths chance that the second marble is green. And then the third marble, well, now there's only eight left in the jar and only two of those are green because the first two that I drew were green. So now we have only a two eighths chance. All right, so four tenths times three ninths times two eighths times one seventh. Good. What's the probability that none of the four draws, none of the four marbles that I pick out are green. Yeah, yeah, good. Probably the first marble I draw is not green, is six tenths, same as before. The second marble now, there's only nine marbles left. And um, of those six non-green ones, I took one out. So now there's only five non-green ones. So the probability that the second marble I draw is non-green, assuming the first one that I drew was non-green, is five ninths. So I multiply six tenths times five ninths times four eighths times three sevenths. And last one, what's the probability that at least one is green? Yeah, 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 same, same. This is the prob one minus the probability that none of them are green. All right, so write down all the answers. Here's what we just said. How did we get five ninths? Well, uh, when the first marble I drew, first marble I drew, there were six, six marbles that are not green out of 10 possibilities. So six tenths chance that the first marble I draw is not green. All right, let's say that first marble I drew is not green. I stick it in my pocket. How many jars are left in the, how many marbles are left in the jar? There's nine marbles left in the jar because I took one out and that one's sitting in my pocket. There were 10 initially, I took one out. Now there's nine in there. How many non-green ones are left in the jar? Well, there were six initially. I took, I took a non-green one out and now there's five left. Uh, I see people mentioning hypergeometric binomial other concepts. If you've taken other stats classes, you might know that stuff. This is not in scope for the class. There are multiple ways to do these problems. If you know how to do them from something you learned in another class, that's fine. But we're trying to teach you the principles so you don't need to memorize formulas or distributions. You can compute it on your own. Uh, in the third one, well, the third one, it's really complicated to compute directly because there are all sorts of different ways you could get at least one green. Maybe the first one's green, uh, maybe the first one's green, the second one's not green, the third one's green, the fourth one's green, or maybe it's not like that. Maybe the first one's non-green, the second one's green, the third one's green, fourth one's not green, all these different ways. And you could compute the probability of each of those and add them up and that just sounds super, super tedious. So we're doing it a different way. All right, let's move on, let's keep going. A hypothesis testing. You can be pretty sure that there'll be a hypothesis testing question on this exam. Um, all right, any time you've got a hypothesis testing question, um, I wanna remind you of the setup. Hypothesis testing is asking you to choose between two 
views, two um, possibilities about how the world might work, about how, uh, what process um, might be happening to generate the data that you can observe. So first, figure out what those two possibilities are. Um, one of those, we're going to label the null hypothesis. The other, we're going to label the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a description of how the world works that has a completely specified chance model. What that means is it describes the chances of everything that could happen, everything that's relevant to the outcome of this experiment. Um, should be specified, completely specified means specified enough that you could simulate data that, that would have happened if the null hypothesis were true. And then the alternative hypothesis is the opposing viewpoint, the other possibility about how the world works. It doesn't have to be completely specified. You don't need to be able to simulate from it. And a hypothesis test is going to help you decide between these two um, perspectives. So it's going to help you draw an inference from some observed data about how the data were produced or how the world works. And the test statistic is going to help you choose between these two possibilities. So the test statistic is a way of summarizing all the data you got, all the observations, might be lots and lots of it, into a single number. And it, you should choose one that, that, that comes up with a single number in a way so that that number, um, that number tells you whether you should favor the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. And in particular, the property we want a test statistic to have is that the larger the value of the test statistic, the more that it makes you uh, believe in, the more it supports the alternative hypothesis. And the smaller the value, the more it makes you believe in and supports the null hypothesis. Or also a K would be the other way around. The larger the val value of the test statistic, the more evidence that is for the null, the smaller the value, the more evidence that is for the alternative but we want it to be smoothly going in one direction. Yeah, I'll do an example. I'll do an example. I'll do several examples. Finally, once you've figured out the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, and you've come up with a test statistic, then your next step is to do the p-value calculation. Okay. And computing the p-value, you're going to do a simulation. You're going to look in the tail of the histogram of the simulated values. The simulated values are going to be obtained. Um, uh, based on the null hypothesis, and you're going to look at a tail. And to help you choose the tail, figure out what values of the test statistic make you lean towards the alternative. And then look on that side of the histogram. So if it's larger values of the test statistic support the alternative, then look on the right tail of the histogram and figure out how much area there is there, and that will enable you to compute the p-value. All right, so um, hypothesis testing. Um, the purpose of this is we want to figure out we see there might be a pattern in the data and we want to figure out, is that real? Does it appear to be indicate something real about how the data was generated or could it just be due to random chance? So a hypothesis test, when we have some data that we think might represent an association, um, helps us decide whether we think there is an association or there isn't. So a very common use of a hypothesis test is the null hypothesis says there's no association and the alternative hypothesis says there is an association. And we're trying to decide between those two viewpoints. And the hypothesis test gives us a principled and uh, quantitative way to make those decisions. All right, uh, p-value. As a reminder, the definition of p-value is the chance that um, in a world, in a universe where the null hypothesis is true, um, if, that, if that null hypothesis is true and is a correct description, it's the chance that the test statistic you'd get um, if you were to run the experiment many times, you might get many different test statistics. Um, what's the chance that the one you got is um, um, at least as big as the one that was observed in the data? It was equal to the one observed in the data or even more extreme in the direction that makes you favor the alternative. Okay, the p-value helps you interpret whether you should make a decision for the null or decide for the alternative, a really small p-value, really close to zero, is evidence that the null is wrong, and therefore that the alternative, by inference, is true. A really high p-value is indicating the data is consistent with the null. 
so you cannot reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis could still be true. Uh, also possible the alternative hypothesis might be true. If you can't reject the null, um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean the null is right. It means the null could be true and the alternative could also be true. How do you know if larger small values of a test statistic support the alternative? You'll have to look at a specific test statistic and maybe think through some examples in your mind. Uh, I find it very helpful to think through really extreme versions. What's the largest value that test statistics could, could, could have and how could that happen? What's the absolute smallest it could have? How could that happen? And that may help you figure it out. All right, so in Swain v. Alabama, um, we did this um, jury um, example of hypothesis testing. Um, there, um, the null hypothesis was that the jury panel was that jury panels are drawn at random from a population, from the broader population in the county at large. So the null hypothesis described the process that is used for computing jury panels. It says, um, that, that view says, this is a random draw from the population at large. And the alternative says, nope, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't randomly sampled from the population at large. There was something else happening. The test statistic we used there was the number of, of, of black, um, well, in this case, uh, men in the jury panel. And um, which values of the statistic support the alternative? Small values of the statistic, because here the alternative says, um, nope, it wasn't random. And in fact, um, it was non-random in a way that led to, to fewer black men. It's not random in a way that was biased against including black men on the jury panel. So in this case, smaller values, the test statistics support the alternative. Larger values um, support the null. Okay, so the p-value is the uh, uh, area in the tail of the histogram. The histogram we got here was by simulating how many black men you'd expect to have in the jury panel if you drew a jury panel at random from the population at large. And we drew a thousand um, simulated jury panels that could have occurred if the null hypothesis were true and looked at the number of black men in them, looked at the value of the test statistic, and this histogram shows the range of values. And um, remember we said that smaller values of the test statistic favor the alternative, so we're looking at the left end, the tail on the left side of the histogram, and the observed value is so small, 8%, um, uh, I think, that it was way, way out in the tail, and the probability of that happening, of getting something in that left tail, uh, if the null hypothesis were true, is infinitesimally small. Okay. Could the test statistic have been 26% minus the percentage of black, panel, of, of black men on the panel? Yes, you could have. And then larger values of that statistic would have favored the alternative. Absolutely. Absolutely. So often there's multiple test statistics you could use that could all be valid. It's not necessarily a single right answer. All right, we did uh, Mendel's model of pea plants. Um, the null hypothesis was um, that each pea plant has a 75% chance of, of being purple flowers. There's no inheritance. Um, it doesn't matter where that pea plant came from. Um, it doesn't matter any, you know, it's just all random, just random, 75% chance. And in particular, Mendel was predicting an exactly 75% chance for the pea plants that he brought up, not larger than 75, not smaller. And the alternative said, nope, that's not a good model. Maybe the probability is larger than 75, maybe it's smaller, whatever. In any case, it's just not, not the null. Okay, so this alternative doesn't specify whether we're expecting, if it's not 75%, whether we're expecting it's larger or smaller, we're just saying um, wasn't, wasn't 75%. This test statistic we used there was um, the percent in the sample that were purple minus 75, and then we took the absolute value of that. So why do we take the absolute value? Yeah either a very large percentage of purple flowers or a very small percentage of purple flowers, both of those would count as evidence against the null. If 99% were purple, that's evidence against the null. 
If 51% were purple, also evidence against the null. Both of those are in some sense, both equally evidence against the null. Um, so we wanted a test statistic where, um, where um, one direction of the test statistic, uh, in this case, um, larger values uh, were uh, represent more evidence against the null. So it really doesn't matter whether it's bigger or smaller than 75, it just matters how far away from 75 you are. So we use the absolute value. This is not an example of the, of the TBD. We'll get to that one. All right, so larger values of this test statistic support the alternative, smaller values support the null. Um, you might not get exactly zero if you raise only 100 pea plants, um, but you might expect that that test statistic should be a fairly small value if the null hypothesis is true. How small? Well, we do a simulation to figure out, and the simulation tells us, um, in this case, um, 0, 1, or 2, or maybe 3 are kind of plausible outcomes if the null hypothesis is true. Um, and then we looked at what the observed value was for the pea plants that Mendel raised, and that observed value um, led to a value of a test statistic that was around, I don't know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And you can see from this histogram that the area of the tail is fairly large. We look at the right tail because larger values of the test statistic favor the alternative. And so then that right tail is everything, all the blue bars to the right of the yellow line. And the area of that is a pretty large area. When you uh, sum up all those, all those bins, it's you know around 50% or bigger. So the p-value now would be like 0.5 or bigger. That's a really large p-value. Um, it's not below for instance, a 5% cutoff. So we would not reject the null hypothesis. And the conclusion we draw is the data is consistent with the null hypothesis. I can't reject the null. Um, this null hypothesis could be true. All right. Finally, you had this GSI's defense example. Um, the null hypothesis was that um, the scores in this particular section, discussion section, um, are like a random sample um, from drawn from the scores of everyone in the class. There was nothing special happening that was different about this section. And the alternative hypothesis was that the average uh, of the scores of people in section three was too low was lower than what you would get if it had been a truly random sample from the population of all, all the students in, in data eight. Okay, so the test statistic we used was the average score in section three, and now smaller values of the statistics support the alternative. Larger values support the null. If the value that section three got was about the same as the average of the class as a whole, that would support the null. Here's something that might be a little confusing. What if the average score of the class as a whole was 80% and section three score was 90%? Would that support the null or the alternative? Well, in this case, it would support the null more than the alternative because that's above average. Maybe it's kind of an unlikely outcome, but it's more unlikely if the alternative was true than if the null was true. All right, so we got, we did a simulation where we imagined um, a hypothetical universe where section three um, scores were like uh, just a random sample from the population of the entire class. And um, we looked at what the average, what the value of the test statistic would be in that universe. And we did that many times and we completed a histogram. So this is the predictions that's made by the null hypothesis. And then we looked at the actual observation and we compared the observation to the predictions that the null makes. And um, here's smaller values of the test statistic favor the alternative. So we need to look at the left tail of this histogram. And um, we need to compute the area to the left of that, that yellow line. That's the p-value. In this example, it was about 5.6%. And so if we use a cutoff of 5%, then this p-value is slightly above that. And so we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So we would say, I can't reject the null hypothesis. The GSI could be right, 
the section scores in their section um, could have occurred from a um, from a you know if there'd been no difference between the sections. Fail to reject the null. That's right. How do you find the observed value of the test statistic? Well, the well, if you do the experiment, or the question should tell you the results of the experiment should tell you maybe what the scores or the average score in that section is. So that's something you'll just need to know. And then you can apply the test statistic to convert that into a value of the test statistic. In this case, the test statistic um, was the average score in that section. So we'll, you normally give you something about the observations in the question. You might have to apply the test statistic to compert, compute, uh, convert that into the value of the test statistic on the observed data, on the observed sample. How do I find the p-value here? It is um, the area of the tail to the left of the yellow bar in this histogram, or it's the probability that if I draw a random sample according to the null, that it'll be less than or equal to about 13. Or if you like, it's the fraction of simulations that gave a test statistic that was less than or equal to 13. So np.count non zero, use that to count how many of the values that you got in all your simulations were less than or equal to the um, value of the test statistic for the observed data. Okay, so hypothesis testing. Um, how to pick a, um, a test statistic. If you've got um, one sample, a bunch of data, and it's one sample, and there's um, the value that you care about um, is a categorical va value, like flower, could be purple or non-purple, that's categorical. Then um, you might look at, example, test statistics, statistics might be the percentage um, of values in that, in that category or the absolute value of the difference between that percentage and some percentage predicted by the null hypothesis. Um, if you've got a category with um, multiple values, more than more than two, more than two values, categorical variable with multiple values, like ethnicity of a jury panel, where there's some multiple possible ethnicities, um, then um, you might look at the TVD. The TVD is a way to compare two distributions, and you might look at the TVD between the uh, observed distribution and the distribution predicted by the null hypothesis. If you've got numerical data rather than categorical data and still one, one sample worth of data, then you might look at things like the mean of that data. You might look at the absolute value of the difference between the mean and what you'd expect from the null. Uh, if you got two samples, like you got data from smokers and you got data from non-smokers, or you got data from a treatment group of a randomized controlled experiment and you got data from a control group, then um, uh, when you got two samples, um, often an A-B test is useful. Um, and for an A-B test, if you've got, um, if your out measure of the outcome is numerical, then often the difference of means is useful. And if the, uh, the outcomes you're looking at are categorical, then you might consider the TVD. All right. Um, cutoffs typically will tell you a cutoff. A standard cutoff is 5%. Um, um, you can assume that if we haven't told you a cutoff. Um, otherwise, we'll tell you a cutoff. And the way you use the cutoff is if the p-value is less than the cutoff, then you reject the null. And if it's not, then you don't. All right. Um, here's a little check for you. Which of the following does the p-value depend on? Does it depend on the null hypothesis? Does it depend on the alternative hypothesis? Does it depend on the choice of test statistic, the data in the sample, all of the above, some of them? All right, it does depend on the null hypothesis. The p-value is computed based on these simulations. The simulations are done assuming the null hypothesis um, is true. So p-value does depend on the null hypothesis. It doesn't depend on the alternative hypothesis. It, 
that, um, well, let's see. I guess, um, oh, huh. Let me rethink that. It does depend on the alternative hypothesis in the sense that we need to know whether the observed statistic, um, which tail of the histogram to look at, whether larger values of the test statistic favor the alternative or smaller values favor it. So in that sense, it depends on the alternative, but only in that limited way. Does the p-value depend on the choice of test statistic? Yes, it relates to the distribution of values of the test statistic. So it definitely depends on the test statistic. Does it depend on the data in the sample? Yes, it does. We're looking at the um, observed test statistic, meaning the test statistic on the observed data. And we're comparing that to simulated predicted values. So it definitely depends on the observed data in the sample. Does it depend on the cutoff? No, no, the cutoff you use only after you've computed the p-value. All right, so it depends on all, it depends on all of the above except the cutoff. All right. Last, I wanna mention A-B testing. Suspect A-B testing anytime you have two samples. Um, A-B testing is really useful if you have two populations, population A, population B, and you've got a sample A from population A and a sample B from population B. And the distribution of, um, of, of values in these populations is unknown. So for instance, maybe population A is the population of all um, mothers who smoke and population B is all mothers who don't smoke or in particular, their baby weights. We don't know what the distribution of baby weights is for either. All right. Or it could be in a randomized controlled experiment. Um, one population might be the population of um, the scores of people who got the treatment and the uh, other population is those in the control group, the scores of those in the control group. And the question we wanna test with an AB test is whether these populations are the same in some way. Maybe they have the same mean, maybe they're the same distribution. So the null hypothesis in an alternative hypothesis is that the distributions of data in the two populations are the same, okay? The samples might not have exactly the same distribution because maybe there could be random chance that leads them to be a little different. But if the null hypothesis is true, the populations are the same. And then the alternative, well, that'll depend. A common one is that maybe uh, the values of group A are on average larger than the values in group B or on average smaller than, or are the average is different between these two populations. Now to simulate under the null hypothesis, if the distributions of the two populations are the same, then for any individual, it doesn't matter which population they came from. The distribution of their score or their baby's birth weight will be the same regardless of which population they came from, if, if the null is true. So if the null is true, the label group A or group B doesn't matter doesn't affect the distribution. So if the null is two, I can take a bunch of observations and relabel them. Just, just throw out the labels I started with and apply some new labels. And that'll still be valid. It'll have come from the correct distribution. So this is a way that I can, um, in some way, kind of create new simulated data by replacing the original labels and putting in new labels. Now, the one thing is I need to make sure that the number of people in group A sample, my simulated sample matches the number in the actual observed sample and the number of group B people in the group B sample in my simulation matches the number in the, in the original data. So what I, when, I, when I apply new labels, I need to do it in a way that so I got the right number of labels with group A and the right number of group B, the same number as in the observations. One way to ensure that I've got the right numbers is to shuffle around the labels, permute, switch the order of them. And if I do that, then I get um, uh, a simulated, new simulated samples. The numbers have been reassociated between samples A and samples B, but that also are drawn from the correct distribution if the null is true. So this lets me do a simulation of what, of what uh, could have happened if the null is true. Then I use that to simulate values under the null, which lets me get a, a histogram of uh, possible values of the test statistic um, that could have occurred if the null was true, use that to make our prediction to compute our p-value by looking at the, at the tails of that, of that um, distribution. So A-B tests are really useful when you have two samples from two populations and 
we don't know what the distributions in those populations are. All we have is the sample or all we have is um, the data. All right, that was anything, everything I wanted to show you in lecture today. If you wanna see more practice, um, go look at the demos. We have a lot of examples in the demos. You can go, go through them on your own. Um, don't stress too much. You're gonna do great. We're cheering for you to succeed. We'll see you tonight at seven o'clock. Good luck.